The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. The shutdown of O'Hare and Midway airports canceled thousands of flights and cost tens of millions of dollars. The devastating work of a single arsonist raises new questions about the security of our most critical facilities. Plus, this doctor's remedies are music to the ears for the injured and needy in Chicago and across the country. And Chicago cancer specialists and their patients make critical breakthroughs fighting the deadliest forms of the disease. We get the latest prognosis on this week's edition of In the Loop. Good evening, I'm Chris Bury. Tonight, a closer look at the fight against cancer and the role Chicago doctors, researchers, and patients are playing in that battle. According to the National Cancer Institute, more than 40% of all adults will be diagnosed with cancer. But people with the disease are living longer thanks to new therapies and treatments. Tonight, Barbara Pinta reports on a Chicago area woman who is beating the odds with the help of her medical team. Singing at the Cubs game, it just felt like I was flying. It was just incredible. It's incredible that Ginger Tam of suburban Wilmette is even alive today, let alone singing the national anthem at Wrigley Field. Three and a half years ago, this talented singer was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer a disease very few people survive. Her symptoms began innocently enough, a persistent cough her doctors tried to treat with antibiotics. They just finally decided they should do an x-ray, and when they did, it came back, uh, they came into the room and just said, do you have any family with you? And I, I said, you know, what? And they said, it looks like metastatic disease, and there's just so much of it. Ginger says her first thoughts were of her young daughter. After hearing the devastating news, Ginger went home and prayed, and then called a friend who happened to know a doctor at Rush University Medical Center. That doctor turned out to be a lifesaver, Dr. Phil Bonomi, director of hematology at Rush. He is an angel. He is just dedicates his life to finding a cure for lung cancer, for treating people, and just has the best bedside manner, and he never he just doesn't give up hope. Dr. Bonomi has been working in the field of lung cancer treatment and research for nearly 40 years. At the start of his career, surviving lung cancer was almost unthinkable. But in the last decade, researchers studying the tiniest molecules have made huge breakthroughs. Solving the human genome, identifying the different genes, figuring out different things that drive the tumors because it's different in different patients. Doctors can now individualize therapies for each patient. In Ginger's case, genetic testing found her cancer had what is called an EGFR mutation. Doctors started treating her condition with an EGFR inhibitor, a targeted drug administered under clinical trial in Denver. And it's it, within a week of taking the drug, I felt better. For instance, Ginger's scan here, we see this is her backbone, this is some of her blood vessels in these right lung and left lung. Here's a tumor mass and here's a tumor mass. And now that she's been started on the third line EGFR inhibitor, both are gone. Dr. Bonomi is thrilled with the results. That's because lung cancer has been among the deadliest forms of the disease with only a 17% survival rate. The disease is being converted to a chronic illness. We're controlling the cancer. Talk about it as a miracle. It is a miracle. New research is unlocking new weapons to fight other cancers. Cardinal Francis George is undergoing experimental treatment at the University of Chicago for cancer in his bladder and kidney. The new drug activates the body's own immune system to destroy cancer cells. Dr. Bonomi believes these immunotherapies are the next frontier in the fight against cancer. The immune system is not so defective, but the cancer cells can kind of put an invisible shield around themselves. So if the tumor cell or the good cells, the lymphocytes trying to kill the cancer, 
are coming towards the tumor cell, they, they lock up with this protein and they can't get to it. These antibodies block that protein and allow them to get to the tumor cell and kill it. Another Chicagoan turning the tide against cancer is only 19 years old. While working at a Rush University lab, Kevin Stonewall developed an experimental colon cancer vaccine, effective in mice. The vaccine could eventually be tested on humans. Ginger Tam says putting cancer in the national spotlight is important for raising awareness and raising money for research. She hopes her efforts will help erase the stigma of lung cancer, pointing out that nearly 20% of those diagnosed with the disease have never smoked. I'm a single mom. I have an 11-year-old daughter. How would she, she watches TV and she says, uh, Mommy, how come they do so much for breast cancer and not anything for lung cancer? She doesn't get it, and I don't get it, frankly. Joining us with more information is Dr. Jyothi Patel. She is an associate professor of medicine at Northwestern Medicine, a thoracic oncologist, and a spokesperson for the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. Dr. Patel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. In your mind, when you look at the scope of cancer research, what are the biggest advances that we've seen in the treatment of cancer? I think when we sort of look at the wide variety of advances we've made in the past several years, it really is heartwarming to see that not only have we made strides in precision medicine in understanding the genetic underpinnings of a cancer and translating that to targeted therapy for patients. We've learned a lot about the immune system and to the promise of immune-mediated um, therapies. We're learning more about screening and prevention, um, and we're learning a lot about survivorship. When you look at cancer and you look at the different varieties of cancer, what makes this disease so difficult to fight? I think one of the challenges in treating cancer is that we, for years, have thought that people have a cancer. But what we're learning is that every cancer is unique, and every individual has an individual cancer. So it may be that we find the genetic marker that is causing a cancer in a particular person on that day. Even if we target that tumor um, with the right medicine, maybe in four months, maybe in six months, the body and the cancer somehow find redundant pathways by which to overcome even uh, very targeted therapy. So like a virus, it finds its way around the therapy? Exactly, exactly. And there are multiple pathways that are redundant. Uh, cancer is a tough opponent. Uh, it is persistent. And uh, despite uh, shutting it down for some time, um, it can become resistant to current therapies. And so looking at not only the cancer, but also the body's response to cancer, I think is the next sort of frontier in how we can defeat the cancer. Talk about genetics. I know there's a big push toward genetic testing. It's become big business, and we know some about that. But do we have enough information to really give people answers when they get these genetic tests? For cancer. So there are two kinds of genetic testing. One is genetic testing on a cancer that's already formed. So testing the tumor tissue to target a particular therapy. And those genetics or those mutations are innate to the tumor itself and generally don't have relevance to the patient's offspring or, or, or to the rest of their family. So for that, we can say genetic testing is absolutely paramount. And we think that it's initial um, diagnostic testing for patients with many advanced cancers so we can get the right therapy. The other testing that you're talking about is to look um, to see whether there is a genetic syndrome which puts you at risk for developing cancer. And certainly um, in this world of talking about BRCA mutations or family um, cancers such as Lynch syndrome, um, absolutely, it's important that we look at a person's particular risk and their, develop, their risk of developing cancer, not in the next year, but over two, three, four decades. Talk about genetic screening and physical screening. There are so many tests that people go through, mammograms, a PSA test through life, and we get mixed messages about um, you should go for a mammogram every year, no, every five years, no, when you're 50, when you're 40. How, how should we look at screening? There are some screening tests which we uh, can say with very strong proof make a lot of sense. Um, one of those is colonoscopy, for example. Another one which has had, I think, slower uptake is screening for lung cancer. So as you know, lung cancer is the most common cause of cancer death. And we've had the largest cancer screening trial um, that was published in the past several years. 
um, ever supported to show that CT screening for people who are considered high risk, so those are smokers or former smokers, um, could decrease mortality by 20%. It's a significant number. When you look at uh, the new treatments and therapies for cancer, we've heard about weaponizing the HIV virus to fight cancers or developing vaccines out of tumor cells to fight cancers. As an oncologist, um, aside from genetics, what excites you the most about therapies that are in the pipeline? So certainly, as you mentioned, I think precision therapy and, and finding the right molecule to turn off um, a protein is probably the most exciting. But how we can use that hand in hand with the body's own immune system is really where my excitement is, um, is today. Uh, we are learning more and more about um, about how cancers overcome immune surveillance. And we have known for a long time that there's some cancers like renal cell cancer and melanoma um, that you can treat with an immune strategy. Just more recently, though, in the past several years, we've seen some great uh, strides with lung cancer, for example. So it may be um, that we can unleash the body's immune system to track down when those cells are really in a minimal residual state. So if you have a great response with chemotherapy or with a targeted agent, it may be that using one of these newer drugs that target the program death pathway, the PDL1 pathway, um, could really lead to some impressive responses and some durable responses. When you started, did you ever think of lung cancer as a chronic disease? Absolutely not. You know, so I remember um, when I started my fellowship, we had just started using Aresa, and we had a, a young Jafitinib, and we had a young patient who had a great response. And just then, you could sort of sense that, wow, this, a revolution is coming. Um, but she seemed like a needle in a haystack, which you realize is that there are 30,000 people like her every year, that for some people, um, it can be it can be a controlled disease. We have a lot of work to do for most people still, for most people with lung cancer, most solid tumors. But at least now, um, I think the science is, is actually connecting and we're actually going from bench to bedside faster than ever before, right? So before it used to take 10 years for the FDA to approve a drug based on initial um, phase three trial, accrual to trial, small improvements in survival that were measured in weeks or months, and then finally getting that, that drug to market. And now, if you look at the story of crizotinib or seritinib for ALK-positive disease, that cycle is two years, right, to go from a novel agent to a clinical trial that shows not an improvement in survival of six weeks, but an improvement in survival of a year and a half in lung cancer. That's huge. Right, that you can, and because of that, the FDA is willing to approve these drugs and is very committed to getting these drugs to our patients. Dr. Patel, thank you for your time. Thank you. We now go to Chris and a look at this week's headlines.